Back in 1993, Curtis Anthony Cates called me and Brother Richard Lee Curry into his office and gave us some exciting news that was going to help both me and Brother Curry at that time. Brother Cates said that he had asked Bobby Liddell to join the faculty of the Memphis School of Preaching. Bobby consented to that invitation and came here 23 years ago. He's done a tremendous work since he's been at the school. I teased Brother Cates a little bit in that meeting by telling him that Bobby's hair was too black for him to be a teacher here, but we have taken care of that problem. <laughs> at least the students may have done that, or maybe the fellow faculty members, Brother Bobby could tell you. He and his wife, Joan, have three children, and two of Bobby's sons went through the program here. And uh, tremendous students, both of them, Tony and Nathan, were. Bobby's daughter's in the audience, and her name escapes me completely. Carrie. Carrie is here today in the audience with their grandchildren. They have seven grandchildren. And so I try to avoid Bobby as much as possible. I want to talk about mine. This is a great man. He was director of the school for six years. He now serves as our administrative dean. Uh, he is a thoughtful, well-balanced, excellent teacher. He, the students will tell you that he reminds them all the time, you can do it. That's an excellent recommendation for a teacher. He's been an editor of several monthly papers. He edited the lectureship book for a long time. He's done meeting work, radio work, TV work, missionary trips. Uh, didn't you do some local work in Florida, maybe in Tennessee at one time? This is a well-rounded, great and uh, young man. And the best thing I can say about Bobby Liddell is He's a gospel preacher, and he's going to come and talk to us now as the lectureship continues. It's great to be with you today. We're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, if you would like to open your Bibles there. We're going to begin with verse 8 in chapter 4 and go through maybe 18 and 5. And spend about 10 minutes on each verse. <laughs> Build your hopes for an eternal manner. The inspired writer, of course, is Paul. And Paul is a man who endured great suffering. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, and notice these words. Troubled, perplexed, persecuted cast down. And then in verses 10 and 11, see what he says about death. As he was in danger of death daily. But then you look at verse 12 and you see how he could do this. How could he endure? Because he had developed an inner strength. Realizing that his suffering was not in vain. It was not only for his benefit, but for the benefit of others. And then you look at verse 13. How could he endure? He endured by faith. The faith. His faith. If we endure, we will endure the same way. You look at verse 14. He endured by hope. The same one who raised the Lord Jesus would raise him and others who live by faith. And without faith, there is no hope. But how could he endure? Look at verse 15. He endured by love. You say, well, the word love is not in that verse. It is. The love of God extended God's grace. And man's love in response extended man's thanksgiving. So Paul endured by faith and hope and love. And thus seeing that his suffering was not 
in vain. He was able to endure and to endure to the end because he understood that there was something that was beyond this life, something that could not be seen with the physical eye, something for which he longed, which he sought, and thus for which he hoped. But look at verse 16. Paul had a right attitude. When we get our thinking in the way it ought to be, then other things will fall into place. He had the right attitude about his being, verse 16. He knew, as we all do, that the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. He had the right attitude toward his burden, verse 17. He said, it is light and momentary. And because he could look at the burden that way, he could have the hope that one day that burden would be gone. And then he had the right attitude toward his blessings, verse 18. By not looking at the things which are seen, the things which are temporal, physical, earthly, as that which is most important, he could focus upon the blessings that are truly important. Those for which we hope one day. And so he had the right attitude, and because of that, he could have the right view. He could focus upon things as he ought to do. And you look again at verse 18, he could see the unseen, and that is that upon which he looked, he gazed intently. If we will do as Paul did, then we can go through our lives without fainting, without fearing, and without focusing upon the wrong things. Because we can look forward to an inward renewal, an eternal reward and a future revelation of that home which we long to have. So let's look at these six points. The first one is, if we build our hopes for an eternal manner, we will not faint. Again, verse 16 of chapter 4, Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And notice how Paul began that. For which cause we faint not. This word indicates to give up, to grow weary because of the difficulties that we face. And this one is that our outward man is going to perish. This is not a surprise. 6,000 years of human experience have taught us that we live and we die. I tell the students when they begin to feel sorry for themselves. Life is hard, and then you die. <laughs> That's the way it is. The outward man perishes. This is not a surprise. But it is also not the end of our existence. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 tells us, the body is going back to the dust from which it came, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And so Hebrews 9, 27, we have an appointment with death. We all have that. Unless we're living when the Lord returns, Brother Curtis Cates used to say, if you live long enough, you're going to die. And the first time I heard that, I thought, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> but it was right. If we live long enough, we're going to die. But death is just a doorway. That is not always easy for us to understand. Paul wrote, Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now if we were to put in that blank, to die is, what would it be? If it is anything other than gain, we have a problem. If we live for Christ, in Christ, by Christ, then we can live with Christ. 
Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. So if we live in the Lord, we can die in the Lord. And so death is coming. This is no surprise. And along the way, we have this deterioration. And again, this is not a surprise either. Though it seems sometimes we don't expect it. You've seen me holding on to the rail as I've been coming up and down all week. I'm having some problems. That's the way it works. And so we have deterioration. We're aging. That black hair is now gray. <laughs> and it's turning white. But that's okay. It's still there. <laughs> But sometimes I hear someone talk about perhaps a beloved mother passed away. After a long and hard battle with some disease, and they will say something like this, her poor old body was just worn out. Well, that's the way it works. The outward man perishes. But we can't give up because of that. To paraphrase Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, don't give up, pray. And so we don't give up. We live in Christ and we continue to pray. And thus, we're not overburdened with care. We're not careful, full of care. Philippians 4, 6. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we let our requests be made known unto God. And so the outward man perishes. And along the way, if we live the Christian life, 2 Timothy 3.12, we're going to face persecution. I've been teaching the book of First Peter at Munford, Tennessee, where I'm filling in while they look for a preacher, if you know one. And 1 Peter 4, 16 is where we are. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf or in this name. But when suffering comes, when trials come our way and persecutions are ours, still we wonder why, as if, again, this were a surprise. So don't give up. The world has given up, but we can't give up. You know why the world has given up? It cannot see God with physical eyes. And so it wants to make a God that the world then can look upon. Don't you know that golden calf, Exodus 32, was something upon which to look? I imagine they made it as beautiful as they could. It's made out of gold. The amazing thing, according to Aaron, was we just threw these earrings in the fire. Out came this calf. Don't give up. The world's given up because it can't see God with its physical eyes. But we can't give up. We can't faint. We know, as Daniel 2.28 tells us, there is a God in heaven. And as 1 Peter 3.12 shows, his eyes are over the righteous, his ears are open unto their prayers. Don't give up. If we think on the outward man, verse 16 again, if we think on that part, then it is likely that we will become discouraged. We will faint. If that is our focus. But when we think upon the inward man who is renewed day by day, then we are encouraged and we don't faint. We can endure and we can endure in that hope for an eternal manner. So number one, don't faint. Number two, if we build our hopes for an eternal manner, we will not fear. We will not fear. Our afflictions, verse 17, are light and but for a moment. 
Fear exaggerates perceived threats. We all understand that, I trust. It magnifies those things that we see as afflictions. And so we fear, and that fear generates more fear. We all could look back at times in life when we feared something, and the closer it got, the more we feared it. And then we experienced that, and we found that it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. We had spent all this time in fear and worry needlessly. And so if we build our hopes for an eternal matter, we can go through this life without fear. But fear cripples the church. How many times have we proposed some work for the church only to hear we can't do it? And then the excuse we don't have enough of this or enough of that or whatever it might be. One thing that impressed me when I was in school at the old Knight Arnold building was when the elders would get up and they would say, here is a good work. We are going to support it. We don't have the funds to support it, but we trust God that he will provide. There's the difference. And so if we build our hopes for an eternal matter, we're not fear. 1 John 4, 18 tells us that perfect love casteth out fear, for there is no fear in love. But the more we look at afflictions, the bigger they get. The dime is the smallest of our coins, but you can hold it so close to your eye that you can't see the sun. Now think of the difference in size. So the more we focus upon those things, then the bigger they seem to be and the badder. But number three, if we build our hopes for an eternal manner, we will not focus on the seen, but on the unseen. Look at verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. We need to get our focus like it ought to be. How do we see these things? By faith, the same way Paul saw them. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance, the undergirding of things hoped for. Notice that. The evidence or the conviction of things not seen. We think about the great heroes of faith. Noah, Hebrews 11.7, by faith. By faith. Noah being warned of God. Notice this. Of things not seen as yet. Prepared an ark. Had Noah seen it rain? I'm convinced he hadn't. Had he seen a flood? No. He hadn't seen those things, but he believed. And because of his belief, then he acted. Look at Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8. He went to a place he hadn't seen. Not knowing whether he went, but he went. How did he go? By faith. You look at the faithful of old, verse 13 of Hebrews 11. They not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Acted by faith. Then Moses, Hebrews 11, 27. He didn't fear Pharaoh, he feared God as seeing him who is invisible. And so we focus upon the things that we can't see. For many years I taught the book of Psalms here and enjoyed that tremendously. Psalm 100 verse 5 has a word in it that is very intriguing to me. His mercy is everlasting. That word indicates that it reaches beyond what we are able to see. And I've made this illustration before. You may have heard it. It's okay. It won't hurt you to hear it again. 
Well, I lived in Pensacola. Sometimes we'd go down to the Gulf in the evening when all the people had gone home, and we'd let our children play in the water, and we'd sit there and just enjoy the sounds and the scenery. Sometimes a ship would go out, and I would watch it, and it would go so far, and then I couldn't see it anymore. And so the truth is that that ship ceased to exist. No, that's not it. It continued to exist. It had gone beyond where I could see. And so the things for which we hope that are eternal are beyond where we can see. They're the unseen. But we can see them by the eye of faith. And so Paul did. How could he endure? How could he have hope? Because he looked upon those things that are not seen with the physical eye, but which are seen with the eye of faith. It is not easy to keep our eyes off of the physical and the temporal things. It is not easy. I'm making a public confession now of a sin of my past. I've asked the Lord to forgive me in the eighth grade. <laughs> I'm sorry I did this. I wish I could tell the poor sweet lady who taught us math, Miss Camp. She's probably a member of the church, and I'll probably see her in paradise, and then I have to say I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I'd cook up something in her class, and, uh, and I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have done it. But one day I said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wait about five minutes, and then we're all going to look at this spot on the ceiling. And we're going to wait until she looks at it, and then we're going to look down. <laughs> and then we're going to wait five or ten minutes, we're going to do that again. All of us, same time, looking at that spot. And then we did that four or five times. <laughs> and you know what? Every time she'd look up there, she never said anything. You say, well, what does that have to do with the sermon? Here's what it has to do with it. When everybody else is looking at something, the tendency is for us to look at it. It is not easy to keep our eyes off of the physical, the temporal, the carnal, the worldly. But if we look upon those things, we'll become discouraged. What if Paul had looked upon those things... Do you think he could have written Philippians 3 and talked about all the blessings that could have been his in a physical way if he'd stayed where he was in that Jewish religion? But he didn't think those were worth anything now because he'd found Christ. And so if we look at those things, we'll become discouraged. We need to remember that the here and now is only here and now. It is always only here and now. It is not going to last. So what is really important? What has a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. We'll talk about that soul in just a moment. But one day all these things will be gone. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 11 tells us the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. They will all be gone. But you know what else will be gone? Our troubles. They will be gone as well if we've lived faithfully in Christ. If we build our hope for an eternal manner. If we have followed the way that the Lord would have us to follow. If we kept in mind, again, Hebrews eleven thirteen 13, that we are just strangers and pilgrims. We're just passing through. We're not going to be here very long. We're just passing through. And so our focus needs to be set on the proper things. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. 
Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. And so if we have our focus like it ought to be, we can have our hope like it ought to be, and we can endure whatever comes our way. Sweet lady came, knocked on my door. She wanted to give me some, well, she wanted to sell them to me, some materials. I said, I won't pay for them, but I'll take them. I said, I promise you, I'll study them. And so she said, okay. I said, but I want you to take something from me. And just happened to have a lectureship book that I had edited right there. And I picked it up. She said, oh, I can't take that. I said, why not? She said, because it, it doesn't, it's not the Bible. It doesn't have Bible. You know, it's, it has to be Bible. I just opened that book up randomly came to a couple of pages. Do you know what? Both pages were covered with scripture. I don't remember now who wrote that lectureship. I appreciate his doing it. But there were quotations from scripture on both pages. And she couldn't argue with that, so she took the lectureship book. She came back several times. We studied over a period of, of weeks. And I could tell she was learning the truth, but she talked to her president, and he stopped that. But the last time I spoke with her, I said, okay. She told me she couldn't come back. I said, uh, if I were to do what you say that I should do, what would that mean for me after this life? She said, oh, you'll be able to live on earth forever. I said, I don't want to live on earth. I live on earth now. I want to go to heaven. She said, you can't go to heaven. It's full. I said, it's full. She said, it's already full. You have to live on earth. But it's going to be good. It's going to be nice. I said, uh, what if I don't do what you say I should do? And she said, well, you'll be annihilated. I said, you mean burned up? Just like that? She said, just like that. I said, what would I care? I wouldn't know it. She said, oh, you'll be erased from the memory of God. I said, I wouldn't know that. You know, that might be an incentive to some people to live in sin. If they could live in sin and the only consequence is when they die, they're gone. They don't face an eternity of punishment. They're not cast into a lake of fire. They're not in that darkness. Forever and ever and ever. That may sound good to some people. The truth is, there is a heaven to be gained. And there is a hell to be shunned. And so if we focus on things that are not seen, then we can have that hope. We can continue in that endurance because we know there's a home beyond this one. Number four, if we build our hopes for an eternal manner, we will look to an inward renewal. What a blessing it is to know that though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. We're getting stronger every day spiritually. More robust. Our health is growing as we live in Christ. That spirit, that inner part of man, that part that animates man, that part that will live on forever. James 2, 26, the body without the spirit is dead. We know that. But with the spirit there is life and we can see, though we cannot see the spirit itself, the effects of that spirit in the body. Daniel seven fifteen. The Lord forms the spirit of man within him. Hebrews 12, 9, he is the father of spirits. Acts 17, 29, we are his offspring. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that spirit's going to go back to God who gave it. So the outward man perishes. We can see that. We can look in the mirror and see that. We can feel it in our physical bodies. We're getting weaker as time goes by. We're going to die one day. That grave is getting closer every day. 
The outward man perishes, but the inward man's getting stronger in Christ. When I obeyed the gospel at the Adamsville, Alabama congregation, I was very much impressed as I got to know some of the members who were older and had been members for 40, 50, maybe more years. They had an in inner calm. They had a purpose in life. They had a peace that I wanted to have. And for a while I tried to figure, how did they do this? Then I realized how they did it. They were living in hope that one day this old outward man is put back in the dust, but that inward man would continue on in a better place. And that one day that body put in the grave would be resurrected and united with the spirit could enter heaven there to be forevermore. And so we have an inward renewal we have heaven for which we long, a place that is undefiled, that is incorruptible, that is reserved for us, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. And so these light and momentary afflictions work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And because of that, we can rejoice and we can live in hope of a better place. A better day. James 4, 14 says that our lives are like a vapor. We were at the old building. I and a student were walking across the, the uh, parking lot. Hot summer day. Asphalt. It had come a brief shower and the vapor was rising from the asphalt. He said, Brother Liddell, what is that? My first thought was, you need to get out more, boy. <laughs> but I said, you know what that is? That's your life. It's like a vapor. It rises and it's soon gone. You don't see it anymore. Not here. And so our lives are like vapor. What is that compared to eternity? Matthew 25, 46 everlasting life a vapor compared to everlasting life if then in this life as we live for Christ we have to suffer every hour of every day until we die if we die as one who is despised by men we're diseased we're downtrodden it looks like Nobody loves us, homeless and helpless, but not hopeless. We've won. We have life as a crown, Revelation 2.10. And so we look for that eternal reward. But then we look for that future revelation. It's not a revelation as we're thinking about the word of God being given. It's simply the fact that we get to go there and be there and see that ourselves. We think about heaven. We study about it. We meditate upon it. We seek to know more about it. And yet after all of that, we're still looking and waiting and wondering just how it will be. I've given up on wondering how it will be. God has given us all we need to know about it. That our finite minds can comprehend. My focus is I just want to get there. And if I can get there, everything else will be just as it ought to be. God will take care of that part. I just want to be there. And so we have a place that will be revealed to us one day if we don't faint, 
If we don't fear, if we don't focus upon the things of this life, if we have that inward renewal every day, if we continue in that hope of that eternal reward, then by faith we'll see that hope come to fruition. Is there any doubt about that? Look at 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know. Is there any doubt about that? Do you know? We can know. We know. How do we know? Well, we're reading it right here in God's book. God said it. Do you believe what God says? We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know. We know that by human experience that we're going to face death. We know that. But we know from God's revelation that there is a place where we can be beyond this life. We don't cease to exist. Read Luke 16, 19 through 31. The rich man died. He was buried. The beggar died. Their bodies were put into the ground. At least the rich man's was. Beggars might have been left on top of the ground. But their spirits were somewhere else. There to await, as the inspired apostle said, a resurrection of the dead. John 5, 28 and 29, both good and bad raised on that day. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, the dead will be raised, the living will be changed, this mortal will put on immortality, this corruptible will put on incorruption. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, the dead will be raised, the living will be changed, we'll meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What kind of body will we have? I don't know. 1 John 3, 1 and 2, well, 1 through 3 tells us we will be like him. That's good enough. So we know while we're here, we groan because of the burdens. Because of this tabernacle in which we dwell that will be dissolved, destroyed. We bought our children a tent years ago. Put it out in the backyard. It was new. It was nice. It looked good. After a while it began to fade and fray and wear and tear and soon it was gone. I expected it to last longer. That's the way we look at life, isn't it? We expect it to last longer. Psalm 90 verse 10 is still in there. 70 years, maybe 80 if by reason of strength. But teach us to number our days, verse 12, because we're not going to continue here forever. But look at verse 2. That doesn't mean we cease to exist. It is not just that we want to be a disembodied spirit. Not only are we going to pass from this life, but we look forward to, be clo to being clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. And notice verse 4. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. And so we live in hope. Verse 7 tells us that when we, through God's blessing us with his word, his teaching about this fact that we're going to die, there is a process even before then of aging. Death is that doorway through which we pass. It is but a transformation. It's not the ceasing to exist. When we understand that, then we can look at it with the eye of faith. So which is better? To be at home in the body, verse 6, or to be with the Lord? Which is better? Is our hope that we might live here forever? Surely not. <laughs> and so we walk, verse 7, that means the way we live. We walk by faith. And therefore, we have hope. How can we have that? Same way Paul did. 
Same way he got it, we can have it. God has revealed to us his will for us. We, trusting God, believe what he has told us and act upon it. Did Paul go seek the wisdom of the atheist, the infidel, the skeptic? Did he look to the philosopher to see what he should do and be? Did he go to the religious people and try to find out what their ideas were? Did he look to the culture of the day and try to live according to the culture of the day? No. He did not walk by sight. He walked by faith. About 30 years ago, a good sister gave me a book. Over the years, I've had a number of members give me books, and so I just want to tell you that's okay. <laughs> it's all right if you want to do that. She gave me a book, and in the back of it, an older preacher passed on, had uh, put a diagram, and he had written out this plan for a house, and he had put under it, My Dream House. I thought, you know, that's, uh, that's a good way to approach what we're talking about today. Not in a physical house, but a spiritual house. There is a dream house for which we long. And we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle word is of, we have. Notice that. We know that we have. Any doubt about that? Absolutely not. And thus it's not a false hope. It is true hope. And we can be encouraged because we don't faint, we don't fear, we don't focus upon the things of this world. We rejoice in that inward renewal. We live in hope of that eternal reward. We understand one day that will be revealed to us. The man who wrote this wrote also Titus 1, 2, where he said that he lived in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so we sing songs about heaven. We love to sing them. One of them is, won't it be wonderful there? Now what is that compared to the light and momentary afflictions and eternity of blessings with God and all the faithful. Build our hopes for an eternal manner.